Hi, and welcome to this episode of Cisco Chat Live. My name is Stephanie Chan, your guest moderator for this week's chat on climate change and how we are addressing it through Cisco technology. So recently, Cisco announced it would reach net zero for greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2040. Achieving this goal will require participation from across the company and our customers and our partners. That includes making our products more energy efficient, helping our customers use our technology to reduce their own carbon footprints and transition the grid to low carbon electricity. Today, we are going to be talking with some Cisco experts who are working on some of these initiatives. And before we get started, a reminder that we'll be taking your questions live at the end of the show. So post your question in the comments if you're watching on cisco.com slash go slash Cisco chat, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and use the Cisco chat hashtag on Twitter as well. Okay, so joining us today is Rakesh Chopra, Cisco Fellow. Rakesh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Stephanie. This is a really exciting and an important topic, so thank you. Absolutely. Um, we are joined also by Shripriya Naranyanin, Product Manager of IoT. Thank you for joining us today as well. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Finally, we have Dr. Cynthia Temesi with our Country Digital Acceleration Program. Nice to be here. Thank you for the invite. Yes, super excited to be hearing from all of our three guests today. And now that everyone has been introduced, we are going to just dive into this conversation. So first, let's set some context. Let's talk about why it's critical for us to address climate change right now and why it's important to all of you personally. So I'm going to start with Rakesh. Um, you were instrumental in developing the new Cisco Silicon One chipset, which dramatically reduced energy consumption for our high performance routers. So I want to ask you, why is Cisco taking action to reduce the impacts of climate change? Uh, thanks, Stephanie. I think that's a, that's a great question. So I, I think there's several different ways to think about it. But at the end of the day, I think we're really at a very fascinating time in the industry. And it's actually one that makes me super excited to work at Cisco, if we're being honest. Um, and I think the reason I say that is at the end of the day, I think we're seeing a confluence of events that drive our focus in a way that's never existed before uh, in the past. And, and if you ask me, I would actually contend that power is the fundamental limitation in terms of what, what we need to solve in, in networking. And that's never been true before. So let's, let's sort of peel that back a little bit. So I think first is ultimately when you really sit down and you analyze now what, what limits the biggest routers that we can build or the biggest switches that we can build inside of Cisco or from any competitor of ours in, in the industry, at the end of the day, it's no longer the silicon. It's no longer the optics. It's about how much power we draw and therefore how much heat we generate and how much uh, uh, power we use to get that heat out of our system. The, the second effect that's sort of showing up is that at the end of the day, it's limiting what our customers can deploy. So today, our largest customers, they're out of power in the rack, they're out of power in the room, and they're out of power in the mm -hmm. facilities. And so power for our customers has now gone from a something that you sort of think about to being sort of a key buying decision uh, perspective for them. Because if you can't fit it in the facility, it doesn't matter how great your product is. Mm -hmm. And it's also happening at a time when many of our customers are similarly adopting either a carbon neutral or a carbon negative environment. Uh, and so every watt that they consume, they have to offset that somewhere. So for our customers, it's, it's really important as well. But I think actually the most interesting one is actually that you know, I think at the end of the day, our planet has a limited number of resources. And there's studies out there which sort of show that by 2030, the amount of power consumed by communications infrastructure is a very large percentage. And so I view it that we have sort of a moral responsibility in terms of sort of trying to address the amount of power that our equipment generates. And, and, and as a full industry, we've got to sort of take talk in that and, and sort of drive that forward. Now, I have kids myself. I have two young boys. They're lovely, lovely kids. And I'm guessing many of the folks out there also have kids. And, you know, we want to be able to leave our planet in a place that is available and, and healthy for our children. So what's interesting about all of this is this creates a fundamentally unique proposition. And so for the first time in history is what I like to sort of think about is, is we have sort of this confluence of events. We have a technological imperative that we have to solve. Power. We have a business imperative that we have to solve power, and we have a moral imperative to solve power. And so this creates what I would like to think about as sort of the perfect melting pot for innovation, 
right? And this is something that we actually realized about seven years ago in Cisco. And as we designed Cisco Silicon One, because of these confluence of events, the way we've designed that architecture and the way we think about our problems, power has really taken sort of a front seat in how we uh, approach all of our engineering problems. Thank you so much, Rakesh. That was a really poignant answer and I think really informative for all of us. I'm going to turn it over to Cindy right now because you are leading a sustainability focus with our country digital acceleration program. So Cindy, why is it important to help our customers achieve their greenhouse gas reduction goals and their other sustainability goals? Thank you, Stephanie, as well as I'd like to acknowledge Rakesh for spot on, couldn't agree more with, with your passion and what you're saying there. We fundamentally believe that climate change and sustainability, you know, that that's our generation to solve. We're here to solve that. The IPCC, in fact, stated that limiting the, the, war, the warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius requires net zero greenhouse emissions every, globally by 2050. This is urgent. It's the world has to come together to achieve net zero. Public, private sectors must come together in both the thinking about nature-based as well as technology-based solutions to remove carbon. And this is where, and, and Rakesh was getting at that as well, this is where Cisco has a great track record around innovation and where we can help. So within CDA, we created a digital sustainability framework, trying to make this simple. It's think of it, think of it as three pillars um, of action models. And one of them is exactly what Rakesh was outlining is Cisco's performance. How and what are we doing as a company? So some of the, 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 the folks on the call might know about our award-winning and notable circular economy design and our teams, our internal teams around that. Number one, supply chain, actually working with our, um, our, our what we call internally as our WPR, but our energy management and sustainability team. They have over 440 projects and counting to, to think about how we in Cisco can reduce our carbon footprint and their projects, um, they estimated, uh, I think it was 140 gigawatt hours of energy consumption saved and, and 6,200 metric tons of CO2 emissions saved or avoided at that point. So that's thinking about Cisco's performance is number one. Number two, it's corporate social responsibility. And, and that's, a, again, another pillar of action is where our foundation committed $100 million over 10 years to invest in climate solutions, bringing innovation solutions and, and carbon for carbon removal to fruition. They also launched a global problem. Well, they haven't had a global problem solvers challenge for a while. And this year they awarded a million dollars to, to technology based startups for addressing social change and environmental changes. First time ever they had a, they had an award for greenhouse gas um, solution prize and just, just a lot of focus from our CSR team. Then the third component is it's really, this is where we really all have to step up. It's technology as a catalyst. How can we help our customers solve for sustainability? So this is a critical piece that experts and customers and market shapers say, Cisco, you need to focus here. This is the opportunity. So how do our product solution services organization meet with other organizations to drive this environmental change? This, and, and the other piece of that is drilling down is we have a lot of good stories. We have a lot of good qualitative measures, but where we really need is the quantitative measurements. So those quantitative measurements will re be reported out and that from a Cisco's perspective is gonna help our, our scope one and two, but and then also more importantly, the scope three and also help our customer scope one and two. So it's a combination of products, ecosystems, and really focusing to develop that customer architecture for sustainability. And when I say architecture, I mean not only technology, but the business architecture to solve this. 
Um, as just, I want to reiterate what, what uh, Rakesh said, we have the opportunity and the responsibility to help with the missions of our customers, suppliers, and partners around how we all decrease our carbon footprint. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cindy. I love the framing um, as the responsibility. I'm going to turn it now over to Sri Priya. Um, you work closely with a lot of our customers, but I know you're also personally committed to this topic. Um, how did that come about? Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Great question. I was raised by my parents in a culture in which it was believed that the earth belongs to everyone all species, including the plants and the animals, and that we have an identity that goes far beyond community and geographical boundaries. We live in an ecosystem in which every species depends on one another for its existence, right? It's a symbiotic relationship. And we all know industry re uh, industrial revolution has benefited humans in so many ways. But the dark side to it is we have depleted natural resources, which belongs to the entire planet that we're part of. In a, in a traditional linear economy, a company designs a product, builds it, and ships it out to a customer. It is not designed for long lifespan, right? When, when the customer is done using the product for a short period of time, they just dispose it. Maybe it gets recycled, maybe it gets reused. But traditionally, this part of li life cycle uh, has not been much thought of in the design or sales process, because we used to have plenty of relatively inexpensive resources way back then to fulfill the demand. But there is a problem though. We are now using more natural resources than our planet can regenerate. And this poses significant risks of uh, supply chain disruption. And it, is in, it does not affect just one industry. It has a global impact. And we are living in that supply chain uh, situation today as I speak. And not only that, but this traditional approach generates a lot of waste. Uh, research indicates that by 2050, plastic could outnumber fish in the oceans by weight. Hundreds of species are extinct uh, from the face of Earth in, in just last century. And that has a repercussion, right? The climate change crisis and the, the global economic crisis are not two separate things. Humans are the biggest contributors of climate change. It is an inconvenient truth. I volunteer at an environmental nonprofit uh, here in San Jose where we plant trees um, across the county of Santa Clara. We teach kids environmentalism because it's really important to invite the, these uh in early on in the life and as a product manager at iot i define products that go out in the world with thousands of customers across the industries uh, like utility oil and gas and transportation uh, deploying tens of thousands of devices we continue to accumulate a huge ecological footprint we all have a role to play uh, in re-establishing uh, harmony and, and unity with the natural environment. And as the other speakers uh, mentioned, it, Cisco is committed to addressing this problem through technology. And that's what is exciting. We have, uh, we still have a chance and we all uh, have to step up and, and do what we should do. True, Priya. I really appreciate that very real and transparent response. Um, I think that's something that everyone completely needs to, to hear. And you make a really great point about the technology. And that's why I will um, switch it over to Rakesh. So the use of Cisco products by our customers accounts for the majority of Cisco's greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so reducing the amount of energy our products use is a top priority for us. One innovation that's helping us do that is the Silicon One chip unveiled in December 2019. So can you tell us how Silicon One is making our products more sustainable? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Stephanie. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I think when we designed Cisco Silicon One, we sort of realized this problem sort of seven years ago. And so when we designed the architecture of the Silicon, we really took power as a first order design challenge when, when thinking about what to build and how to build it. 
Now, I've been working on this program for a very long time now, but still today, I actually have to admit that I'm still astonished when I go back and I look at the data to see how much we've actually managed to move the needle from where we like where we were before. And, and ultimately, if I sort of do a backwards looking lens on all of the products that we shipped inside of Cisco, there really hasn't been a time where we've done this large of a jump or this big of an improvement. And it's because we've realized the problem that we need to address and we're really sort of tackling it head on. So one way I like to think about what we've done is if I compare it to our previous generation, uh, Corrado, the, the Cisco NCS 6008. So this is a product that we ship inside of Cisco. It's a successful product that we've launched uh, and has been shipping for a while. And we're able to replace that product now with devices built on Cisco Silicon One. So it's a good sort of direct comparison point of previous generation technology. So if we look at that product, NCS 6008, uh, it is a very, very large router. It's about seven feet in, in height. Obviously, you can't see my hands moving on, on the camera, but, but it's a huge, huge piece of equipment. Uh, it consumed about 11 kilowatts of power to deliver eight terabits of bandwidth. Now, if you think about taking that router and shipping it to a customer, okay, that is a lot of equipment to ship. It fits mm -hmm. on about 10 pallets. It consumes about 570 cubic feet and weighs about a ton. Uh, and to build that piece of equipment, it took us 2,000 pieces of silicon in the data plan to be able to do that. So a very, very large, complex, heavy, power-hungry router. If I compare it to Cisco Silicon One and a product that we ship, which is sort of comparable to it, it's our Cisco 8201 that we announced back in December of 2019. Um, it really could not be more different than that in, in almost every respect when you think about the environmental impacts. So as opposed to being seven feet in size, it is two inches tall. It's about the same height as a golf tee. Uh, it, instead of about 11 kilowatts of power, it consumes just 415 watts of power. So we've reduced the power by 96%, uh, and we're actually delivering 35% more bandwidth in that massively smaller amount of power. And as you think about shipping something, which is the size of a golf tee, right? obviously the shipping weight comes way down as well. So our shipping weight, we've dropped by 62 times, all the way down from one ton to 32 pounds. And our shipping volume is down an astonishing 202 times, down to about 2.8 cubic feet. So all of a sudden, right, we've approached this problem in a very different way than we ever have before. So let's think about how that sort of affects things downstream. So obviously the greenhouse gases for the emissions of the product to deliver the power our, at our customer facility is massively less, right? It's consuming just 415 watts as opposed to 11 kilowatts. But think about some of the other effects as well. As, as you think about shrinking the size of that shipping uh, material, right? Think about the waste that we're no longer generating. As opposed to 570 um, cubic feet of, of shipping material, we're now shipping just one tiny little box. So whether that is being recycled or going into a landfill, it is a lot less to sort of manage on the back end. And if you think about what it means from a facilities perspective, what our customers need, when you get these 10 pallets of equipment into your facility, you have to have a very large room to just unpack that material and dispose of the waste. Then you need to rack this one ton piece of equipment into your building. You have to go in through large elevators, all of these things can now be simplified in a very, very massive way by the time that you shrink the size way down. So, you know, I think one of the questions that I get is on this is this all sounds great, but, but why is this true? How is this possible? And at the end of the day, it does go back to Cisco Silicon One. In that previous NCS 6K product, it took a little over 2,000 pieces of silicon to build the data path. So that when I say data path, I mean the pieces of silicon used in moving the data through it. We've managed to converge those 2,000 pieces of silicon down to one device. Okay, And that is the fundamental reason we can shrink everything down in a massive way. And as you shrink things down, you can really drive the power out of the system. Um, and so this is well beyond what we sort of traditionally think of with sort of Moore's law improvement, where, you know, silicon process technology helps us get to a problem. This is all because we have decided to really, really focus on trying to drive an environmental impact uh, based on the way we design our products. And we're thinking about it very, very differently. And I think what's great about it is that if we look around in the industry, 
there's really nothing which competes or is even comparable to what we're talking about from Cisco Silicon One. So actually my challenge to our competitors is to take up the challenge, right? We all have to get on board with sort of trying to drive the power efficiency of our equipment. And we know that we can do it because we've done it in Cisco Silicon One. And so everybody else uh, should step as, up as well. Now, since December 2019, we haven't been staying still. We have been pushing really fast on Cisco Silicon One. So we've actually come out with 11 devices uh, since December 2019, all improving on what we started. Um, and, and, you know, I know that today we're talking about sort of the environmental impacts behind what we're doing, and that's incredibly important. But I'd also just wanted to highlight one other aspect that this sort of enables. If you think about for a second, the number of places in the world where you can deploy a one ton piece of equipment and deploy 11 kilowatts, it's a pretty small number of places in the world that can take a piece of equipment like that. But as you shrink it way down and you get the power way down and therefore the cost way down, all of a sudden you open up the notion that you can actually deploy bandwidth in places in the world that were fundamentally impossible to reach before without the sort of technology investment. And you think about what that means from a socioeconomic impact as well, right? You can all of a sudden bring more parts of the world online and connect people in ways that you weren't able to do before. And think about what happens when you take those people who weren't connected before and you take their brain power and you have them focus on the effects of trying to drive environmental impacts. At the end of the day, like I'm obviously very excited about Cisco Silicon One because it's, it's so hard to actually overstate the implications by what we've done. Uh, and so it's, it's amazing in the past, but what I'm most excited about is sort of taking this challenge forward into the future. Thanks, Rakesh. Yeah, it's just incredible to think about, you know, shrinking this technology down and the implications that it has for the opportunities, not only for sustainability, but like you mentioned, of digital divide as well and bridging that gap. So that is just absolutely incredible. Thank you for that, that insight. Um, so one thing that will be critical to reducing the impacts of climate change is increasing the use of low carbon energy sources like wind and solar. So this question is for Sri Priya. Some of our innovations in IoT are enabling customers in many sectors to move towards more renewable energy sources. Um, can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, we have a great example of a customer from utility industry talking about how our IoT products are helping them meet their sustainability goals. Uh, I have a brief customer video to share and I'd be right back to discuss it. Let's be clear, our future depends on renewable sources of energy. Germany is one of the most livable countries in the world, where life and nature work together. But a reliance on carbon-based energy is threatening all that. That's where Energiewende comes in. Literally, it means energy transition. The end goal is eliminating the carbon footprint in the energy system. And now with companies like Energy leading the way, there's no turning back. Harness wind, capture sunlight, generate power. Sounds simple. In practice, there are challenges, starting with the fact that renewables have a fluctuating generation profile. In other words, the wind stops blowing, the sun stops shining. To keep stability in the system, there has to be a balance between generation and consumption. That's what IoT technology does for us. It helps maintain that balance. Energy partnered with Cisco to develop a new router that meets energy industry requirements and protocols. Then with these industrial routers, we connected the utilities infrastructure on top of a secure, modular and scalable network. It's easy to use, deploy and manage for both our field technicians and our distant OT operations. In 2018, for the first time ever, renewable sources generated 40% of Germany's electricity and it's on course to reduce greenhouse emissions in 2019. Cisco IoT will help them do it with technology that preserves not only the environment, but also a way of life. Between a carbon footprint and a path to the future, there's a bridge. So as you saw in the uh, video, utilities are front and center in the efforts to fight global warming from cutting down their own carbon emissions to assisting other industries like 
transportation, in cutting theirs. So when utilities incorporate more renewable energy sources like solar, wind, to meet their sustainability goals, they face new challenges, as you heard from our customer. The renewable sources are not predictable. It requires them to manage their grids proactively uh, to deliver uh, reliable power that we all want. They face huge penalty for every second the grid is down. Uh, so digitizing the grid helps increase efficiency at which they can leverage more renewable uh, sources. And we are seeing great progress in the utility industry with their use of our IoT products. And it's not just uh, utilities. We have multiple industries adopting uh, our Cisco IoT products in their, in their network to meet both their business goals and uh, sustainability goals. But why uh, our IoT products? Firstly, they are rugged. Uh, they, our products are designed for outdoor deployments, so they can withstand uh, the environmental conditions uh, like extreme temperatures, whether it's, it's in Texas or Alaska. Uh, they, they are uh, built to meet those or tolerate those extreme conditions. Uh, they are humidity tolerant. Uh, they don't need any additional cooling or heating, uh, which is otherwise called for um, in, traditionally in a, with a traditional device. And also they um, meet with industry standards like smart grid compliance for utility or safety regulations uh, for, uh, for, for uh, oil and gas industry. Secondly, our uh, new generation of products have future-proof design. Uh, with that, what happens is it extends the life, uh, lifespan of the product and lifespan of the deployment by 10 plus years. And these are critical industries, right? And that's what they expect. Uh, the modular design of our products help our customers uh, keep up with technology advancement by just simply upgrading the individual modules without having to throw away the entire product. And that dramatically reduces the materials that are disposed of uh, prematurely. And that helps conserve uh, natural re resources like metal, paint, etc. Lastly, the new generation of products are energy efficient. As Rakesh uh, explained, uh, industries have power limitations. Ironically, uh, even utilities have power constraints when it comes to operating their network because they, they have a huge uh, legacy infrastructure. Uh, and uh, it's also because they have to design their network to be blackout resilient. And that requires uh, the network to operate uh, even with a battery backed power, which is typically on the lower side. So we are putting a lot of thought and planning into uh, the energy consumption of our products. Uh, since our products are deployed for an extended period of 10 plus years, uh, the energy usage uh, adds up quickly. And I I'm happy to share as an example that our new catalyst uh, IR1101 rugged series router has reduced uh, idle energy consumption by 45% from its previous generation and 35% uh, when running on full load. Uh, so considering the sales and deployment over a 10 year period, that saves tens of thousands of metric tons of carbon emissions. Shrifriya, I love that. I love hearing just the real examples of energy reduction that our technology is able to, to do. Um, this question is for Cindy. Uh, so like we mentioned, you're involved in the Country Digital Acceleration Program, where we collaborate with government leaders to help them achieve their digital vision. Um, can you tell us more about the role sustainability plays in this program and how it's benefiting our customers? Sure. Thanks, Stephanie. So our mission within CDA or the country digital acceleration, as, as you indicated, is to work with government leaders, but also the academia and the business side of a region or a country or a nation to bring together and bring to life their digital agenda, solving for solving their most pressing issues as as a society. We're within CDA, we partner with about 40 countries and we have about a thousand projects underway at this time. And right now what we're doing, well, we've been doing this for a, a little over a year now, is we're taking a little bit of a deeper look at sustainability 
And think about with CDA, you think about business investments for public good. So some of those examples it, that I think can bring bring to life some of our work is one of them is, is uh, ASHRAE, working with ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Cooling Conditioning Engineers. So it's a standards body. So in phase one, in working together with them, we help them design a smarter building, thinking about turning on and off lights automatically. Um, the building's air ventilation system adjusts automatically, reducing energy consumption and making it more efficient. So when you think about um, how you can best help, it is around efficiency and optimization in behavior. Um, phase two, right now what we're doing with ASHRAE is we're, we're beginning to think through how we would help them have a net zero building. So solar energy is converted into DC electric electricity, it's stored, and then it flows to and from our POE switches, devices, and in buildings. So think of it as a self-sufficient energy system based on solar power. Buildings account for 30 to 40% of the global energy demand. Solutions that reduce that number um, require that building, building construction energy operations play a key role in that transition. The second example is we partnered with the Department of Agriculture and a small strategic and small strategic businesses in India to pilot a agri-digital platform. We installed IT, uh, IoT uh, sensors in rice paddies and, and prawn farms to collect data on moisture levels, temperature, pH levels with that. And then the data from these sensors is combined with satellite images and AI analytics to create insights on crop yields, weather, weather forecasts, detection of plant disease, and, and perhaps um, destruction by insects. So all this data is aggregated into a dashboard that helps with uh, helps with the helps farmers predict and think through farming conditions from an efficiency perspective. The third example that I'd like to share it's it's within the UK. And we collaborated with business and technology partners and local government. And what we're doing is we're trialing a vehicle to grid technology to improve the commercial viability of fleet management as well as sustainability of the electrical fleets. So think of it as a, a V to G um, excessive char access, excuse me, excess charge in EV batteries um, can, can be used to power local buildings. And I also think about imagining, imagining the impact of every parked vehicle ha has on the uh, battery on the edge of the network to help power the country. So a few examples that we're working through there, I believe we're going to share our website at the end, um, a, a website within CDA to, to learn more about those stories. Awesome. Cindy, there's just so much cool things that are happening across smart buildings and agriculture and electric vehicles. So very cool to hear you talk about it. Um, so Rakesh, what is next for the Cisco engineering team? How do you plan to leverage innovation for a greater impact uh, from a sustainability perspective? Uh, awesome question. So, so in, in my mind, actually, I, I think about this in sort of two different ways. And I'm actually going to play off a little bit of what both uh, Sri Priya and, and Cynthia said earlier, which is, you know, we think about or we, we've historically thought about the problems of sustainability in terms of, of energy consumption and, and shipping weight and packaging. But I think there's also the question about how long can you use a piece of equipment, right? The longer you can use that piece of equipment, the less the, 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 the longer it's deployed, the less likely it is to end up being recycled, uh, the more you're using your, your resources efficiently. So I think one of the other the impacts associated with Silicon One is if you can change the cost profile and the power profile of the system in a very fundamental way. You can have customers buy bandwidth that they don't need today, but maybe they need in five or six or 10 years from now. And you can use a software licensing structure to allow them to get in at a low cost and then deploy over time without having to rip and replace that, that piece of equipment. So it's something that we can layer on top of the innovation that we've done from a hardware perspective with intelligent software to sort of uh, maximize the longevity of our equipment. But if I sort of 
think about just new innovations from a hardware perspective because I am a hardware engineer. And so that's how I usually think about problems is at the end of the day, we will obviously continue sort of innovating from a Cisco Silicon One perspective. Every generation we do will be better than the last one. And so we'll continue to improve that. But to me, that's actually not good enough. I think we have to continue to make large scale changes because as great as we've done in the past, we can always do more. And that's the challenge that we have ahead of us. And so at the end of the day, what I like to think about what we're doing these days is, is we're adopting a fundamentally different methodology and thinking about how to design hardware. And that's what I like to refer to as a power first design. Every design decision that we make must be graded against the question of how much power does that choice make? And is that really the right choice to make from a planet perspective? Now, the consequence of that sort of design methodology is we end up spending a lot of time analyzing where we spend every single watt in our product. And it forces us to drive innovations in silicon, like silicon one that we've been talking about, or in lots of other areas of hardware, in PCB materials to minimize loss for delivering our current, in connectors, in power supplies and cooling technologies. And how do we optimize all of this for what's really happening on that piece of equipment? So the real consumption is actually lower, not just data sheet numbers. Uh, and to that end, we're exposing a lot of telemetry from our underlying hardware into our software systems to allow them to optimize the real world conditions that equipment is running in to minimize its power on an ongoing basis. The way we build our silicon and our packages is fundamentally designed in a way to sort of optimize heat transfer, allowing us to run fans slower, saving power from that perspective. But I think what's actually really almost the most interesting question when I think about all of this is, is I like this notion of what I call sort of a life of a watt. I like to think about when we consume a watt of power in silicon, what does it really go through? How does that watt flow? And what you see along the way is that there's a magnification effect. So it goes through a lot of conversions inside of our systems. So what we pull from the wall outlet is more than a watt. And then through the customer facilities, it goes through a lot of um, layers as well, a lot of conversions. That all generates heat. It all needs to be cooled. And so what you see if you run this analysis is that for every watt that we pull in a piece of silicon, the grid has to deliver between two and four watts of power. So there's a very, very large magnification effect that happens uh, over the life of, of, of the watt in, in, in quotes. So what this all ultimately means is that we can do a lot of things ourselves in Cisco, and we are doing a lot of things for ourselves in Cisco. But to sort of play off what Cynthia said earlier is we can't do it alone. And so we're engaging with our customers in a very fundamental way to talk about how are their facilities built? How are they using our equipment? How do they optimize our facility? How do we optimize our equipment? And probably most importantly, how do we co-optimize, right? If we are just thinking about things in isolation, we might miss the bigger picture. And so we're spending a lot of time building those bridges and having those discussions so that we make sure at the end of the day, we are maximizing the impact that we, uh, that we can have. Or if I sort of you know, simplify this all a, a, a bit is, you know, I view at the end of the day, there isn't a watt that isn't worth attacking. We need to get every single watt out of the system that we can. It doesn't matter how big or how small it is. I think we're probably all, of, you know, uh, aware of the terminology or the, the phrase death by a thousand cuts. But I like to think of power usage as basically death by a thousand milliwatts. And so we've really got to simultaneously look at the big and the little and make sure that we're sort of optimizing that end-to-end -end story um, and, and just, you know, do everything that we can from an innovation vector because technology can really, really help. And now that we've got these sort of confluence of events, I think it's shining a light on the fact that, that we need to focus and it's allowing the engineers that exist in the world to really sort of do amazing, amazing things. Rakesh, thank you so much. A lot of really interesting points that you made there. I love what you were saying about 
almost like design thinking and solving for a problem from the very genesis of like designing a tech product. I think that's really important. Um, so next question for Sri Priya, you talked about uh, why our customers use our IoT products. So what was your thought process that went into the design of the products to address their environmental footprint? Yeah, great question again. Um, so instead of looking products uh, at, at products as something to be consumed and disposed, we view them as valuable assets that can be used again and again. This new approach is driven by the concept of circular economy, which is based on a few simple principles. Let's bring up the slide, please. So our uh, circular design strategy spans across five focus areas. First is the materials. Incorporating recycled content into our product is, is really important. Uh, reducing material waste um, and material usage and considering resource scarcity as part of the materials selection is really important. That's part of our supply chain strategy today. The second is standardizing and modularizing components. Uh, and or maybe enclosures even to simplify our supply chain and enabling easier repair and, and remanufacturing and making them more durable and environmental um, and environmentally friendly, friendly and easier to use for multiple life cycles. Uh, one example is our uh, IR1101 router that I talked about. It employs a highly modular and expandable hardware design to extend product lifetime. Uh, customers have the flexibility to add and upgrade components uh, as, the, as their needs change or technologies evolve, uh, such as with the rollout of uh, 5G, right? And uh, with, with, there's also uh, additional added uh, benefits uh, to that, uh, which I'll come, uh, I'll come to that in a, in a bit. The next thing is sustainable packaging and using uh, recycled materials, reducing foams uh, and uh, usage of plastic in packaging and moving more towards uh, fiber-based design. The next thing, and uh, I also want to mention that uh, as Rakesh uh, said earlier, uh, we have customers you know, deploying thousands of devices, right? And, and there's a huge barrels cost associated with that. They, they, it, it easily piles up. Right? And, and there's a huge benefit to reducing the packaging waste and, and it reduces the logistic costs as well. Uh, the next thing is uh, energy consumption. Uh, we all know now that we've heard uh, uh, from Rakesh why it's really important. It improves uh, energy efficiency. Um, uh, you know, if you improve energy efficiency, it saves on the carbon emissions, right? And there could be activity, we have activity-based uh, power management features uh, built into the software and we could have a uh, better uh, design of the hardware to for smart energy consumption. The last one is uh, uh, designing our products for disassembly, easy disassembly and repair or even reuse uh, and designing, making sure the products have modular components such that they, it's, it's easy and it facilitates uh, reuse and, and repair. And we are making this strategy part of our design DNA by integrating it into our uh, design practices. Next slide, please. One example uh, is our uh, Catalyst 1101 uh, that I mentioned earlier. It employs a highly, we have done uh, several, um, we have adopted these design principles into our product. As you can see, the first thing is standardizing and modularizing, right? And with that comes the benefit of extended product lifetime, uh, which our critical uh, industries really need. It increases uh, the lifespan of the product and it, uh, it, it also helps them uh, move from one uh, technology to the other or uh, easily repair and reuse without having to throw away the entire product. And that is an investment maximization both for uh, customers because they get to keep almost 80% of their asset. And for uh, Cisco, we are able to drive innovation faster. We are able to bring products out in the market uh, much faster than uh, if we have to uh, come up with a, with a brand new product, right? 
And uh, next thing is energy efficiency. So we, as I mentioned, uh, we've we've done a lot of uh, engineering innovation to to reduce losses within the system. So we've done things like uh, single phase con uh, conversion instead of dual phase conversion to minimize loss. And there there are m several other things that we have uh, improved on to achieve this energy efficiency. And the last uh, one is uh, sustainable packaging. In this regard, we've have, we have ensured that uh, we eliminate foam. So foam, as you all know, uh, or you might know that um, it's it's not compostable, it's not recyclable either. So it's very environmentally damaging. Uh, we've uh, made sure that there's no foam component within our packaging. Um, we have uh, we also provide multi-pack option because again customers buy in in thousands. So uh, we've made it easy for them to procure and store and deploy. And uh, we've also made some optimization within the box uh, such that we're able to increase the utility uh, of, of the packaging uh, box. We used to ship two boxes in the past. Now we have uh, made uh, efficient packaging design such that we're able to uh, incorporate or add more components into the into the single box. So yeah, those are the ones. Wonderful, Shripia, thank you so much. Um, this question is for Cindy. I'm excited to hear about this one. I understand the CBA team is leading a sustainability partner innovation challenge to drive more innovation in this space. So can you tell us more about that and how can our partners participate? Yes, we are, and it will launch soon. So also I have been given um, caution that I can't tell much at this point, but I can provide teasers. I can pe provide te teasers to our U.S. partners around that. And the reason I want to I want to call upon I love the word that Rakesh used was co-optimization. And then I that made me think about co-design, co-development and co-divest, co-invest. And I'm thinking that that's what we're trying to accomplish with our partners. So we are launching um, the first ever a digital sustainability challenge with CDA and our America's partner organization. And it's really about bringing partners together to solve and tackle those most pressing issues, sustainability issues within our customer base. Our primary goals are to encourage partner enablement, partner enablement between partners as well, foster innovation and seek environmental impact. So those impacts that we're looking for and think of qualitative stories as well as quantitative measurements, very critical. Reduce greenhouse emissions, how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do it and measure it? minimize waste, reduce energy consumption, and then increase adoption of renewables. Think of stories as well as think of measurements that we're that you are proposing to get from the the, the co-working, co co-environment together. So we invite all US uh, Cisco based partners to form a team of individuals from one or many partner organizations and stay tuned for more information on how to apply guidelines and more on prizes. So those will be posted um, on Sales Connect, as well as there'll be e emails generated and sent out to our U.S.-based partners. Coming soon. Thanks, Cindy. And thank you to everyone. That was an awesome conversation. Um, we are now moving on to Q&A. I think we have one question uh, from Greg on Cisco.com. He says, great session. Good to hear what Cisco, um, how Cisco is working on this. Curious, what are some steps we can take to be more energy efficient at home? So what are you doing at home in this time of hybrid work to reduce your footprints? Okay, okay. I'll step in. I'll okay, do it. Cindy. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> the first one is around traveling less. That's, that's an obvious one, but then my carbon footprint ab absolutely um, has changed because of that. And it's, it's interesting. I had a conversation with my husband who was, was traveling and I thought, well, why, why are we traveling? How can we reduce that? And why would you, you know, taking more of a, a commercial jet with more of a carbon, you know, less of a carbon footprint with more people on it? I don't know. It was, a, it was an interesting conversation and really challenging each other's, do we really need to travel by plane or is there, or even by car, 
we have gas guzzlers. So why would we be doing that? Um, so it's just, it's making me think more about it from our home perspective. And then the other piece is around efficiency, getting back to an efficiency and optimization of lights when we do chores, how we run actually our sprinklers or non-sprinklers in a, in a, during a drought season and really thoughtfully, it's just bringing it to the forefront about, well, do I really need to do that for as long, it, the, the watering, or can I keep, can I shorten it? So just some of the things that it's, it's really brought to the forefront of our conversations at home. So I'll play off of what you said there, Cynthia, because I actually a lot of that sort of resonated uh, with me. Um, so, so I think both my wife and I, we've had the same sort of conversation about travel. And, you know, I think what the pandemic has sort of forced us all to think about is how much travel do we actually really need to do? At the end of the day, the WebEx meetings are shockingly effective. And, and the, whether it's I'm not getting on a plane to go and talk to somebody or I'm not driving into the office, there's, there's obviously a, a sort of benefit there from an environmental perspective. I think that the other one that sort of is, is a, sort of a weird little offshoot is, is because I live in California, water is a very scarce resource and we you know, focus a lot on, on water conservation in our house. And you know we do little things like uh, capture the, the um, water from the shower in a bucket to flush our toilets and, and things along those lines. Those are not things that I would uh, necessarily try and pull off at the office. Um, and so there's there's some uh, added uh, effects of that there. Um, and then the other one is, is sort of, it's a little bit unintuitive until I sort of saw the data, which is, you know, one of the, the questions that I had about the whole pandemic in terms of, of environmental impact is, is there a flip side of the story from the lack of traveling and going to the office to the fact that we're all at home on our computers connected to the internet and, and consuming energy in that fashion versus at the office. And I think one of the interesting things that, that I've seen in the data is that, you know, the network has really sort of been built out uh, in, in most locations based on sort of peak bandwidth requirements. And, and if you look at where that really is, actually it has to do with things like watching Netflix and TV, right? Everybody comes home and turns on the TV and people have to build their networks for that bandwidth because you've got to be able to deal with that. And typically at home, because most people are in the office, that bandwidth curve comes way down and that stuff is just consuming power. But what's interesting is that because everybody's on WebEx during the day, what actually happens is we just sort of leveled off the bandwidth usage. And so in a weird way, it's actually a very efficient usage of the bandwidth that's been provisioned in the network because now we're using it during the day for work and at night to watch sort of Netflix. Um, and that's sort of, again, an unintuitive thing that I, that I hadn't realized until I saw some of the data set behind it. Um, and, you know, being at home, it, it's pretty easy to, you know, uh, wear warmer clothes when it's a little bit chillier outside, um, shut off all the lights. Um, and so, you know, you, you can control your own destiny to some degree in, in, in a house, which is sometimes easier than a, a full office environment. Cool. So the first thing for me is uh, definitely travel as well. Uh, we don't do commutes at all. And um, in, in my business uh, role, um, I used to travel a lot, whether it's customer visiting customer or uh, it's a, for a conference. Uh, we have learned to do that all remote, right, virtually. And we have become, we have learned uh, and uh, through our experience, learned to be uh, learned how to be more efficient and uh, productive at the same time. And um, you know, on the personal front, I, I used to visit my family back in India every year. I haven't done that in the last two years. I'm, I can't wait to travel uh, as soon as things open up. But um, uh, you know, and jokes aside, we we have all restricted ourselves from travel because of this situation. Um, but yeah, that has a profound effect on 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 the on the environment, right? So that's mm -hmm. one for sure. Uh, first thing for sure. The second thing is I I I now um, you know because I'm at home, um, I, I I get to spend more time with my plants in in my patio, and uh, I and uh, and in just in the last couple of months, I 
I, um, you know, had an opportunity. I came across this article there that talked about how you could you can reuse water, and I'm experimenting a few things that, uh, you know, the water I use for washing dishes. Um, obviously, you don't want to put chemicals in that, and I'm buying, you know, more compostable and non-chemical free um, dish washers. Uh, so that water is is reusable, right? And I'm I'm feeding my plants with that water, and it's really flourishing because some of the the minerals uh, are uh, helping plants grow much much faster. So those are the two things. Awesome! Thank you all for your suggestions. I actually have another um, three suggestions from our workplace resources team for some very basic yet useful um, information. So unplug devices that pull power when they're not in use. Um, put them on a power strip if you want to just easily hit one button. Uh, for uh, thermostats, keep them at 68 degrees Fahrenheit in winter and 74 in the summer. Or is that opposite? 74 in the winter and 68 in summer? I'll figure it out. Um, and then make sure your washing machine and dishwasher are full before running. Mm -hmm. So just are some basic tips for you all out there. Um, and that's all the time that we have for today. So I would love to thank our guests, Rakesh, Sri Priya, Cindy. Thank you so much for joining us and for the super interesting and helpful discussion. And for you all out there, thank you so much mm -hmm. for watching Cisco Chat Live. We will see you next time. Thank you much.